Hello, I'm Tony Guider. This is my New York. Have you ever seen this woman? Yes, you have, in fact. Her face is everywhere in this city. She is the most celebrated artist's model in American history. One of the New Yorkers, exceptional people you've never heard of, people whose lives comprise a biography of our city. The latest work from Sam Roberts. No one knows New York better than Sam. He's next. Sam Roberts, it is so good to see you. Welcome back to the program. Tony, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to have you. You have completed with this wonderful book a trilogy of quirky New York histories which are full of dazzling information, but are a lot of fun to read. And I wonder if they're fun to write. They are so much fun to write, which is one of the reasons I wrote them. The other two books are sort of about material history, History of New York and 101 Objects, right. a History of New York and 27 Buildings. And this one is about people, the New Yorkers. And what I wanted to do was sort of a biography of New York. But it's a biography told through people that most New Yorkers have never heard of. What's the criteria? I mean, it's arbitrary, obviously, because there are... I think you did the research. There are something close to a billion people you could have picked. Uh, well, there are, by some counts, about a billion people who have ever lived in New York uh, since it was founded, uh, at least by Europeans 400 years ago. Uh, but, you know, out of that, I tried to pick people who were interesting, who were transformative, who were emblematic of some sort of transformation, and for the most part, who were not the kind of people you would find in ordinary histories or guidebooks, and who were dead, uh, because I think uh, it's right. too early for us to evaluate the importance of people who are still living. So I'm surprised you're even here, because that work, what you just described, that research, you must have been burrowed in all kinds of archives for centuries. Well, not centuries, <laughs> but years. Uh, but it was so fascinating to find these people because I had never heard of them. Uh, again, there are one or two who you would know, but I found uh, that I included them for reasons that were different uh, from why most people know them. Um, uh, John Jay, we all know he was yeah. a Supreme Court justice. He was governor of New York, but he's in the New Yorkers for a reason that almost nobody knows about, including many people who have written biographies of John Jay. Uh, he refused to take the position of Secretary of State in the Confederation of the United States unless Congress moved the capital of the United States to New York City because he was mm -hmm. a New Yorker, and he did not want to be in Trenton or Annapolis or some other city. And because the capital was moved to New York in that period, in the 1780s, that played a pivotal role in the revival of New York after the Revolution. And that really was instrumental in the comeback of New York, which was devastated after the Revolutionary War, after seven years of brutal British occupation. So just for that alone, he's included as one of the transformative New Yorkers. Well, I uh, see what I said. Nobody knows New York like Sam, and it, that's in the book, and one of the reasons to read it, there are many more. Uh, you, you say that some of the stories were, uh, that you discovered, these people were, uh, their stories were irresistibly bizarre. Can you think of one? Well, you know, the old expression, you can't fight City Hall. Yes. Uh, I found what probably is the first man who fought City Hall. And even he, before there was a City even Hall? Even before it was built. <laughs> uh, they were doing the groundbreaking for City Hall, and uh, they set off cannons to celebrate this groundbreaking, and they shattered the window of this jeweler who was across the street from City Hall, and he sued the city for breaking his window, and he actually won. Uh, and, you know, he filed the suit. It took him about a year to get his claim settled. 
uh, but he was apparently the first person who set the precedent of fighting City Hall, and he won his suit. And it just seemed like such an interesting thing. He's my hero. Yeah. Um, let's get to that woman I, I showed at the beginning of the program. Her name is Audrey Munson, and you have dubbed her, and I have certainly believe she's America's first supermodel. Who, who was Audrey Munson? Well, Audrey Munson was this woman who supposedly was walking down the street, maybe Fifth Avenue. The legend uh, varies in its retelling, uh, and she was discovered by a photographer. Uh, and started doing modeling for sculptures. Uh, and people don't know it, as you said earlier, but you can find her all over New York. The main monument at the southwest corner of Central Park, her most prominent position is as the face of the loftiest statue in New York, which is on top of the municipal building across from City Hall. That is civic fame, as it's yeah. known. And her face uh, was so beautiful, according to sculptors, that they used her as the model of Miss Manhattan on the statue that uh, stood at the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge, statues in the public library, statues in the old Hotel Astor, mm -hmm. statues supposedly the Pulitzer Fountain in front of the Hotel Plaza, uh, and all over the place. She was the model for hundreds of statues at the uh, Panama Pacific Exposition yeah, I think you in say, San Francisco. I, I think you say there were uh, 1,500 statues at that exposition, and she was the model for, like, more than 1,000 of them. That's right. Most of those have been destroyed, but almost all of the ones she did in New York are still around. Yeah, we should mention a couple of others. I mean, Daniel Chester French, who... Uh, you may have heard that sculptured that figure of uh, Lincoln in, in Washington, you know, sitting there in that wonderful uh, monument. Uh, Daniel Chester French apparently uh, sculpted Audrey uh, for a statue called Memory and another one called Morning Victory, and they're both apparently at the Met Museum. That's right. And then after uh, being a uh, sculptor's model, she... Uh, was uh, starring in what uh, is billed as the first nude major motion picture, silent picture. You didn't have to say much uh, in that time. And it was billed as an art movie, but it played in uh, legitimate houses, including Greenwich Village, uh, generated a lot of publicity. And then she was involved in a murder case, uh, a case where she was the uh, third party in a doctor who was accused of murdering his wife. And then she was declared insane and died in an insane asylum at the age of 104. And the Times never ran her obituary, which You're I think, a Times obit writer. I am a Times obit writer, and I think I'm going to write her obituary for the overlooked feature uh, that the Times is doing on people we never wrote obituaries about and should have. Yeah. Um, uh, that film, by the way, that, that, that first uh, leading lady nude scene is called Inspiration, in case you're hunting on, on Amazon or Netflix or something for it. Um, you, t you say that she, was, she had an insatiable craving for publicity. I mean, she really uh, was modern for her time because she didn't wear the kind of clothes everybody else wore. She apparently traded some favors for, or was at least asked to, to, to model. Uh, what else can you tell us about that part of Audrey? Well, in a way, you know, at least according to those times, and this was the 19-teens going into the 1920s, uh, she was a publicity hound. And if she wasn't herself, obviously all the people who were promoting her were. Uh, and she was also sort of a feminist. Uh, she wrote and apparently had the ability to write herself uh, columns for the newspapers at the time, newspapers that, needless to say, exploited her. But she talked about the fact that women should stand up for herself, themselves, uh, that they shouldn't allow themselves to be exploited, uh, which was sort of an interesting twist on what she did, and also pointed out that 
models, sculptors' models, were themselves exploited. That yeah. actresses made a portion of the proceeds of movies, uh, that uh, uh, actresses on the stage were compensated on the basis of proceeds of shows, but sculptors' models just were paid for posing, and that was it. Nobody got any more money from the, uh, the appreciation of their statues. That was it. They got paid one time and never again, even though those statues were around in perpetuity. Audrey Munson, that's her name. Uh, let's talk about Elizabeth Jennings, who... Uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, she... Uh, Elizabeth well, Jennings... Uh, she, pre she prefigured uh, Rosa Parks. Go ahead. Elizabeth Jennings was a uh, teacher uh, who was uh, getting on a bus, a uh, trolley, on the Lower East Side to go to her church on a Sunday morning. And the conductor said, you can't get on this trolley. This trolley is for whites only. You have to wait for the next one, which is for colored people. And Elizabeth said, no, I have, I'm in a hurry. I'm late to play the organ at my church. And she got on anyway, and she was evicted. And Pretty, pretty forcibly. Yes, she was. And uh, her family filed suit. Uh, and the case was uh, brought in Brooklyn Supreme Court, where the Third Avenue Trolley Company had its headquarters. And her lawyer was a man named Chester Arthur, a young lawyer, who later would become president of the United States. Yeah. And she won the suit. This was in the 1850s, a hundred years before Rosa Parks did the same thing in the South. And she established a precedent that a public transportation company, at least in New York, could not bar properly behaved people, regardless of race, from public transportation when they were properly attired and properly behaved. And this is a woman who virtually no one ever heard of again, uh, Elizabeth well, that's, that's, Jennings. Yeah, that's fascinating and, and, and horrific in a way. And you point out in the book that Rosa Parks the Montgomery bus boycott and, you know, not moving back in the bus where she, when she was asked. Um, when she died, her body lay in state at the, at the United at the States Capitol. Capitol. And as you point out in the, in the book, The New Yorkers, uh, even black historians forgot about Elizabeth Jennings. It's true. She was clearly ahead of her time. Uh, clearly, you know, there were reversals, and then after the Civil War, the period of Reconstruction, which not just affected the South, but affected the North. Uh, but it did set a precedent, certainly a legal one. There were reverses after that. But Elizabeth Jennings did set, with Chester Arthur as a lawyer, did set a legal precedent in New York almost the same one that Rosa Parks would set in uh, Montgomery a hundred years later. And she had the guts to stand up and uh, fight, not only physically, but legally, fight uh, the trolley company that barred her from getting on that trolley. I, I found it fascinating, Kute, you include an account of her, of what happened to her that was published in the uh, Tribune, the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley mm -hmm. was the editor, and he was a he was a uh, anti-slavery. He was a staunch abolitionist. Abolitionist. And you look at some of the other papers and how they treated the case. Either they ignored it or they ridiculed it. Uh, and it's fascinating to see how uh, cases like that, and frankly, how uh, black New Yorkers were treated as a matter of course. Uh, in the in the public domain at that period, and apparently the only um, honor she has received, besides being remembered and in this book by Sam Roberts, is that um, about what 15 years ago, the third and fourth graders at a school on the Lower East Side uh, named the street corner where her acts, where her you know where the confrontation with the uh, bus the trolley company took place, where she tried to get on the trolley. They named that street corner for her. Right. The students, their teacher, uh, lobbied a local city council member and got the street corner named for her, which uh, is the least uh, that ought to be done. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, there are so many wonderful people in this book. Uh, William Wilgus, I never heard of him, uh, 
is the chief engineer of the, of the New York Central Railroad, and he uh, could be said, as you say in the book, to have essentially founded, built Midtown. Well, it's fascinating because I also wrote a book on Grand Central. Yeah. And I talked about the fact that uh, it transformed America. And frankly, when I came up with this subtitle, I walked away from the publisher and said, how am I ever going to, you know, uh, fulfill this subtitle? How does a train station or, in fact, a terminal transform America? But then I realized it actually did. Uh, among other things, uh, it came up with the whole notion of air rights for buildings. Uh, architecturally, it came up with ramps, which had never really been used before. Uh, uh, it, the sleeping car porters union was created at Grand Central. Uh, but one of the things it did, uh, electrification of trains exactly. uh, really was a precedent set at Grand Central. It allowed the New York Central Railroad to deck over these open train yards on Park Avenue. And that, uh, combined with the air rights, uh, allowed for <clears throat> the development of Midtown Manhattan. And the development of Midtown Manhattan shifted the center of gravity of Manhattan from sure. downtown to midtown, and virtually all of that was attributable to uh, Wilgus, the chief engineer of the New York Central Railroad. Yeah, who was not an architect, and, and uh, as you mentioned, the electrification of the trains began, I guess, in 1898 or something. And uh, the point being that if they're electric, the smoke is gone, they can be buried, and Wilgus says to the railroad, Here's what we should do. We should get rid of the depot that was Grand Central then, and it wasn't that old either, but let's get rid of it. Let's build a whole new place. We'll deck over all these open train yards, and the pictures are <laughs> remarkable of what Park Avenue used to look like. We'll deck all of that over, and we will lease the air rights above to developers and whoever wants to build on it, and voila, and it wasn't just an aesthetic thing or a money-making thing. The problem was that with all that smoke and grime and noise in the tunnels coming from like 96th Street down to 59th Street, there were crashes yeah. because the engineers couldn't see ahead of them going into those train yards. So this was a thing that not only uh, turned out to be a great real estate deal, uh, but it also saved the railroad from liability uh, from the accidents that occurred in those tunnels. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's a guy in the book, and I've got to say, I, it's hard to wrap my mind around this. I just can't get the sense of time. There's a fellow named Charles Dowd, and he made, let's just say as a teaser, he made time stand still. He Tell literally him. made time stand still. He was a professor at Skidmore College. This is the kind of thing that you just can't imagine. But there were hundreds of time zones in the United States because time was set by the railroads, uh, not by anything else. Time was where the noon was where the sun was in the middle of the day, in the middle of the sky. Well, so stop, stop there be, for a second and just think about that. Noon was set astrologically yes. with sundials. So when it was noon in New York, it wasn't noon in Newark. No, it could be 1203 in Newark. Yeah. Uh, and it would be, uh, you know, you would be taking a train ride from Boston to New York to Chicago, and it would be different times based on noon in each city. So if you had to switch trains, or if trains were intersecting, uh, you would have a hell of a time figuring out timetables, much less keeping trains from running into each other. There were a lot of train wrecks. There were a lot of people who missed their trains. And Dowd tried to figure out how do we create time zones across the country so that we could rationalize the system of travel between uh, going across the continent. And by the way, as, as Sam says, he was a professor of what? Philosophy. Philosophy. I mean, he was not an engineer or a time expert or something. Not at all. 
And, you know, it was up to him. And finally, uh, the railroads adopted this system of four time zones. And it was uh, implemented for the first time at Grand Central Terminal in New York. In fact, it's interesting, there is a clock at Grand Central in one of the passageways. And under it, uh, there, very proudly, the New York Central wrote Eastern Standard Time. Of course, about eight months or so of the year, that is wrong because it's daylight savings time. But the railroad was so proud of the fact that it implemented standard time there. And of course, the piece de resistance of this story is that uh, Charles Dowd, who got very little credit at the time for creating these time zones, uh, Charles Dowd died in uh, upstate New York because he got hit by a railroad train. In Saratoga and, Springs. In Saratoga Springs, New York. And <laughs> the train was late, by the way. Yeah, and it was speeding. Speeding and um, and and to put you, a bow you just on. You can't the, make this stuff uh, up. To put a bow on the irony of it, he gets killed by a train that's speeding. Um, something he was involved with in times of trying to fix it away with these time zones. And when they memorialize him in in um, Saratoga Springs, they do it with a sun a sundial. <laughs> Somebody I, wasn't thinking. <laughs> yeah, clearly. I mean, I, I wonder if that sundial is still there. I believe it is still there. I used to live there. Keeping near, perfect time by the sun. By, by the sun, sure. I used to live near there. I should, I should, if I ever go back, I should uh, check it out. The Charles Dowd sundial in, in Saratoga Springs. I mean, that's what's so fascinating to me about the book. Now, you, you know, why are there 31 people? Because I had to stop somewhere before a billion. Uh, but there are just yeah. so many fascinating people um, and it's interesting that uh, Thomas, Carl Thomas Carlyle said, uh, the history of man is but the biography of great men. Uh, first of all, he left out women, but he never defined great. Uh, and, you know, he said a great men, the, the people who led armies over the Alps, or are they some slob who invented the shovel? Uh, well, you know, it, it's both. And what I tried to include in the book are people who did maybe sort of ordinary things and were seemed to be ordinary people at the time, but in retrospect had fascinating legacies. Uh, and these are the New Yorkers who I tried to include. Well, you included also, uh, I'll just tick off a few others, uh, the victim of the city's first recorded homicide, murder in, seven, in the 17th century. 1609. Uh, and, and the first victim, one might argue, of racial profiling in the city. Yes. Which I found fascinating. Yeah. Uh, the high school dropout who slashed crime rates in the 20th century. And uh, we all know him, I think, because uh, as reporters, we encountered him all the time, a fellow named Jack Maple. I, I found that... Uh, especially at the beginning of the story, uh, fascinating. Uh, he, his father thought, and I think he agreed that he was a loser. Yeah. That, that guy was never going to amount to anything. That's so. right. He uh, was a high school dropout. He wasn't going anywhere. He took civil service jobs, uh, tests for almost any job he could find. And, uh, you know, his father said, you're going to wind up dead as a soldier in Vietnam unless you go out and get a job. And luckily, he became a transit cop and worked his way up through the ranks. And I call him the commonsensical cop because he came up with the idea of CompStat. And the whole point of it was prevent crime, don't just respond to crime. And that's one of the reasons, not the only one, of course, but one of the reasons that crime plummeted uh, in the 1990s. Yeah, CompStat is a difficult term to uh, kind of parse, but it, it comes down to really holding uh, precinct commanders and even higher ups uh, to uh, a real uh, dressing down almost <laughs> like every no. every day. And, and it's, it's sending cops to where the crimes are likely to be committed rather than responding to the crimes. Yeah, he mapped, you know, he would he would he made maps and he kept 
it, you know, putting dots and pins and things and saying this happened here, that happened there. And, and, seeing, and looked at the days and, and the hours and yeah. looked at the people who were committing the crime and said, let's be proactive instead of, you know, yeah. getting the guys after they commit the crime. He saw, he, he saw the patterns and, as you say, proactive. And I, I love the fact, and I think I, I think uh, Jack once mentioned this in Elaine somewhere. He used to hang out a lot. That uh, you know, when the commanders of the precincts complained that his, uh, and you have this in the book, when when they complained that his Comstat meetings were at 9 a.m., he said, "Okay, 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. you, right. you don't like 9 a.m. How about 7 a.m.?" And he was just you know a beat cop starting out and you know, surprised himself that he wound up, uh, in effect, the deputy commissioner. And got, I, I guess, would you say, is it fair to say he got, he got run out with Bratton because, because of Giuliani's he, ego? Uh, I think that is fair to say, yes. Because they made the, what is it, the front, the front the page? The cover of Time. The cover of Time and a few other articles, and, and Rudy was yep. thinking... Hey, wait a minute, I'm the mayor, they shouldn't be... Right, Bill Bratton was smart enough to use him uh, to the fullest. Yeah. We just should, we just should paint a, a brief physical portrait of, of, uh, of Jack, who... If wore... you think of Bo Brummel, I guess. Yeah, a Hamburg and spats and a bow tie. And it was, I didn't know this until reading your book. It was all an act. I mean, he, he, was, he was busted. He had no money at all. No, right. But he was looking like a million bucks. No, he worked for the money store because he had borrowed so much money. Yeah, <laughs> Jack Maple. It's, there are plenty of reasons to read The New Yorkers uh, by Sam Roberts. There's plenty of reason to read anything Sam Roberts writes. But uh, this is delightful. So go out and get it. And I am so glad you are here and we had this conversation. Tony, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And thank you folks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week.